that, I'm, I'm really pleased to be, uh, to be speaking at this course today. Um, and as Jean said, well, the topic is uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And um, pardon me, I'll be boring you with... Uh, um, sorry, I, I need to share my screen. And, and that doesn't seem to be working at the moment. Jean, I think you have to allow her to share her screen. Uh, she she has um, she has the rights. Or you could send me the slides, go her, and I'll upload them for you quickly. If, if that's another as a backup. Okay. Okay, I'll um, I'll do that. But this is a little. Uh, Okay, um, so I'll, I'll send you the slides right now and begin talking in the meantime about the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is um, usually uh, referred to as the cornerstone of the international non-proliferation uh, regime. And it's, um, it's really a, a founding instrument and uh, around which the rest of the regime sort of is, uh, is built. And the regime consists, as, you, as you've probably um, had a chance already to um, to discuss in previous lectures of a variety of instruments, be they legally binding treaties or organizations such as, as the International Atomic Energy Agency, and Laura will talk about the safeguards that IEA implements, uh, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, uh, and also informal arrangements uh, such as the uh, export control regimes, the nuclear suppliers groups, anger. Uh, but uh, they all somehow still relate to, to the NPT uh, and perform functions that are related to the NPT. The Non-Proliferation Treaty was negotiated in the 1960s and, and it uh, formally really that started in the multilateral context with a series of Irish resolutions at the UN General Assembly uh, calling for uh, negotiating a legally binding instrument to stop the spread of nuclear weapons. Um, it took some time for uh, the resolution to, be, to gain unanimous support and it happened for the first time in 1961. And then the U UN uh, 18 Nation Disarmament Committee, the predecessor of today's conference on disarmament, took up the negotiations. And in 1965, UN General Assembly adopted another resolution tabled by the eight non-aligned members of the 18 Nation Disarmament Committee, setting out the main principles for, for the future non-proliferation treaty. And, and there, were, uh, there were such concepts as the need for uh, there to be a verification and control for the need uh, for balance and fairness in obligations between uh, armed, nuclear armed and, and nuclear unarmed states. And, and the, the treaty being a step towards uh, complete elimination of nuclear weapons, not just uh, a non-proliferation goal uh, in and of itself. The negotiations uh, went along uh, sort of two parallel tracks. One was the multilateral track in the 18 nation disarmament committee. Very importantly though, uh, a bilateral understanding between Soviet Union and the United States was needed for the uh, for the treaty to uh, to be concluded. And once that happened, um, it's slide number four, Margarita. One second, it doesn't allow me to do it. One second, oh, I'm getting there. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. See. see, I was having the same issue. It just wouldn't let me do that. Um, so. Uh, it was necessary for the two superpowers at the time to agree on the key provisions of the treaty uh, before true progress could be achieved in the multilateral setting. And so once that happened in 1967, the US and Soviet Union tabled identical drafts of the, of the treaty. Uh, and the draft that they tabled uh, really focused on the non-proliferation provisions, yeah, on, on promises not to transfer nuclear weapons, not to acquire nuclear weapons, and um, Slide number four, or four, four, no, we're going to, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, Sorry and then, so, thank you, and verification. And then provisions on peaceful uses and mm -hmm. on, uh, on disarmament were uh, added in the, in the process of multilateral negotiations at the insistence of nuclear, uh, non-nuclear armed states. Next, please. So uh, uh, a quick uh, snapshot of, uh, of the basic sort of statistics on, about the treaty. Uh, the, the text was approved in 1968 and opened for signature, uh, entered into force two years later on, in March, 1970. 
the three depositories of the NPT are uh, United Kingdom, United States, and Russia, formerly Soviet Union. These were the three nuclear armed states that actually participated actively in the negotiations of the treaty. Two other countries that already had nuclear weapons at the time, China and France, did not take part in the negotiations. As of today, the treaty is one of the most widely adhered to international agreements. Uh, it has 190 states parties. The asterisk is there to account for some disagreement about the status of North Korea under the NPT. North Korea is the only country that withdrew uh, from, from the NPT, but there, there was no consensus agreement among states parties about how to account for that withdrawal, whether it happened properly or not. So it's kind of 190, 191, depending on how you count. And the, the only countries that never joined the NPT are India, Israel, Pakistan, in South Sudan, uh, three of whom are known to possess nuclear weapons and it's not South, South Sudan. So India, Israel, Pakistan, they are nuclear armed state out, states outside the NPT. Next, please. And, uh, and speaking of the di distinction between nuclear weapon state, nuclear armed state, one of the first things that the NPT does um, and that work and that is, the, is set the definitions of what is a nuclear weapon state and a non-nuclear weapon state. And because this is the founding instrument, the cornerstone, uh, those definitions basically apply throughout the regime. So nuclear weapon states are only those that manufactured and exploded a nuclear explosive device prior to January uh, 1967. Uh, and all the other states by definition are non-nuclear weapon states, even if they happen to acquire nuclear weapons later down the road, which is the case for India, Pakistan, and, and Israel. And so the official nuclear weapon states, uh, next, next please, um, is our, our US, UK, uh, Russia, China, and, and, and France, all of these countries sort of made it on before the, uh, before the cutoff date. Next, please. Uh, another thing you'll or very often hear about the NPT, along with it being a cornerstone, is that it has three pillars, uh, and and those are those represent the three kind of basic bargains that that go into the NPT provisions. Uh, those are non-proliferation, disarmament, and peaceful uses. Uh, next, please. So non-proliferation obligations are set out in the first three articles of the NPT. Uh, where nuclear weapon states promise not to share their nuclear weapons, not to transfer control over their nuclear weapons to any uh, recipient whatsoever, and not to assist or otherwise encourage non-nuclear weapon states to acquire nuclear weapons. Non-nuclear weapon states, for their part, promise not to receive nuclear weapons and not to acquire them otherwise. And to uh, demonstrate their uh, compliance with the uh, Article 2, non-nuclear weapon states accept safeguards on all their nuclear materials in all peaceful nuclear activities. And the implementing body for those safeguards is the International Atomic Energy Agency, and, and Laura will talk um, about that. Uh, in addition, there is a provision that uh, non, uh, no trade, no nuclear trade with non-nuclear weapon states will proceed without uh, IEA safeguards, without assurances that uh, the materials and, uh, technologies received are, are used for people, peaceful purposes. Next, please. Uh, we can skip over that because we, we do have the queen of safeguards to, uh, to cover, cover what those are. Um, Article 4 of the NPT deals with peaceful uses, uh, again included at the insistence of non-nuclear states because they, they were concerned, especially the developed ones, the industrial industrialized countries in, in Western Europe, they were concerned that by foregoing an option to acquire nuclear weapons, they will also miss out on the uh, benefits of peaceful uses of nuclear energy and technology. So they wanted a guarantee of protection of their right to, to use nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. Uh, and uh, for developing countries, in addition to, to protecting that right, it was also important that to include provision that the special needs of developing countries would be taken into consideration in, in the uh, promotion and exchange of, of nuclear material and technology knowledge uh, having to do with peaceful uses. So Article 4 does not grant a right to peaceful uses, it recognizes uh, the right to peaceful uses. 
um, as long as it's exercised in conformity with non-proliferation obligations set out in Articles 1 and 2. Um, and in the uh, recent review conference and re review process meetings, there was discussion about linking that right also to compliance with Article 3 with uh, safeguards obligations. Thanks. Uh, Article 6, nuclear disarmament. Um, it's, uh, it's also uh, clearly included because of uh, the interest of the non-nuclear weapon states to make sure that the treaty is not simply about stopping new countries from acquiring nuclear weapons, but also um, a step towards the ultimate goal of the elimination of nuclear weapons. And during the negotiations, different non-nuclear weapon states wanted more specifics on disarmament. They wanted more uh, concrete commitments on timeline, timelines, on specific measures, um, but it was impossible to, to agree on that. So as a result, we have a fairly broadly phrased Article 6 that commits all states parties to the NPT to negotiate in good faith uh, effective measures towards cessation of nuclear arms race, which was in full swing at the time, um, towards nuclear disarmament and eventually towards uh, general and complete disarmament. Unlike the non-proliferation provisions, uh, nuclear disarmament provisions don't have an implementing body, they don't have specifics of verification of timeline, all that was politically impossible to include in the treaty at the time. And as a result, the, the uh, the whole history, basically, of the non, uh, of the NPT review process is is this quest for more specifics on disarmament, how um, how to plan for next steps, how to measure progress on nuclear disarmament, how to implement Article Article Six. Next, please. Um, some of the other uh, important provisions in the treaty. Jean mentioned already nuclear weapon free zones and uh, Pilindaba Treaty in particular. At the time when the NPT was negotiated, uh, concluded in 68, uh, one nuclear weapon free zone uh, already existed. That was the uh, Latin American one by the Treaty of uh, established by the Treaty of Tlatelolco. And so Latin American countries uh, in particular saw it uh, important that the NPT recognizes and does not infringe on the right of countries to uh, come to regional arrangements to establish total absence of nuclear weapons. Uh, and that's, that's article seven of the NPT. Article 10 contains uh, provisions on withdrawal. So every state has a right to withdraw from the NPT if uh, uh, some supreme circumstances of, of um, interest uh, demand that. Uh, it needs to provide a notification and explanation of those circumstances. And, and uh, uh, the withdrawal goes into effect 180 days out later, I think. Uh, and then or 90 days later, sorry, I need to <laughs> refresh my, my knowledge of Article 10. Another provision was that the treaty would be in force initially only for 25 years. And at the end of that period, state parties must decide whether to extend the treaty indefinitely or for some other period of time. Uh, finally, Article 8 is the one that establishes the review process of the NPT. Uh, every five years, state parties get together to uh, review and assess the implementation of, of the treaty. Next, please. So I guess the most interesting part is, is really going over the NPT review process. It's kind of a living organism of, of the treaty. And, and this year we might finally have the 10th NPT uh, review conference. So a lot of the preparation and thinking is going into that at the moment. Next, please. Oh, what, what does the review process structure look? So the treaty itself only says, you know, convene a review conference five years after entry into force. And then, and then as if you decide to do, keep doing it, keep doing it. Um, and, and that was the structure, basically one, uh, usually one prep com meeting and then, and then the review conference until 1995, I think. And, and there in uh, 1995, a strengthened uh, review process decision established the structure where you need uh, we need to have three pre preparatory committee meetings uh, and four if necessary uh, before you have the conference. So at the, at the moment we have this five year cycle that begins with the first prep com, then the second year we have the next one, next and third prep com, and the year four we have the review conference, and then there's a gap here. Next, please. 
what does the review conference structure, uh, review conference itself look like? Um, so we have the presidency in the plenary and um, it's uh, always presided by a, a, a diplomat from a non-aligned country. Uh, and then the work is, uh, substantive work is delegated from there to the main committees. Main committee one deals with disarmament issues and it's always chaired by a non-aligned uh, uh, representative as well. Main committee two deals with non-proliferation and regional issues uh, and the questions of safeguards, for example, uh, fall, fall into, under that committee. Uh, and it's always chaired by a representative of Eastern European group. Main committee three, deals with peaceful uses and other issues, and is chaired by a representative of a Western European uh, and other state group. Since 2000, it's all the year 2000, it's always also customary to establish subsidiary bodies under those main committees to deal with uh, more specific issues. So uh, main committee one is uh, has a subsidiary body one, and that body is uh, tasked with negotiating forward-looking agenda on disarmament, forward-looking steps. Uh, subsidiary body two is tasked with the question of the Middle East WMD free zone. And subsidiary body three tackles other issues. Sometimes I think it's, it's there just for, for balance, uh, but there are issues that are not you know, peaceful uses related necessarily, but have to do with the broader questions such as how do you respond to a case of a state withdrawing from, from the NPT uh, and further strengthening of the review process. Next, please. Um, the goal of every review conference has been to adopt a final document by consensus, preferably. Um, and and uh, under the strengthened review structure, what you want to do is have a backward looking assessment of the implementation of the treaty and past decisions and uh, a forward looking agenda, you know, planning for the future, uh, forward looking steps, uh, especially on nuclear disarmament. And usually nuclear disarmament in the Middle East are the two issues where the most debates, the most crucial debates take place uh, with regard to both assessing implementation and more importantly, planning future steps. Next, please. Uh, some of the uh, key review conference outcomes, key review conferences uh, are the 1995 Review and Extension Conference, 2000 uh, and 2010 REFCON. These are the three that have had the most consequential outcomes for the NPT regime. Next, please. I'll just go quickly. Uh, 95 was very significant because that's when the treaty was up for renewal. Uh, that was the absolutely overarching goal of, uh, of the conference and its president to get an agreement on extending the NPT. Uh, the two sort of main strands of, of positions and main positions going into this conference among states parties were uh, whether to extend the NPT indefinitely or by 25 years. There were other proposals about rolling extensions for five years, uh, but the, the two main com competing ones were indefinitely and, uh, and 25 years. And eventually the states, uh, states parties agreed on indefinite extension. And, and Jean is uh, one of the, the, the key experts who can uh, tell you how, that, how and why that happened. He played a direct role in that. Uh, and I'm saying it because South Africa, uh, South Africa's position and vision that the South African delegation brought to the conference were very important for uh, shaping what became the outcome of this conference. Uh, uh, South Africa came in with support for indefinite extension, breaking away from uh, many of the non-aligned states who were pushing for 25 year extension. Uh, but uh, it also brought this idea that uh, it's not enough to simply extend the treaty indefinitely. We need to in enhance accountability and we have to uh, introduce benchmarks and, and measures for, for progress. Uh, and that's the idea underlying the, the strengthened review process. Um, other countries, uh, Indonesia, Mexico, they also contributed ideas, Canada, uh, and, and a lot of that fed into the decision too on principles and objectives for nuclear non-proliferation disarmament. And that is basically the first uh, adopted forward-looking agenda in, in the NPT review process. Uh, some of the steps that were contained in the principles and objectives uh, included uh, concluding negotiations on the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty by 1996, uh, beginning negotiations on 
uh, FM uh, fissile material treaty by 1998, um, support for uh, strengthening of safeguards that was taking place, the work that was taking place at, at the IEA, uh, and provisions that new nuclear trade, nuclear supply agreements with non-nuclear weapon states should require comprehensive safeguards as, as condition of supply. So together, this, these decisions form this kind of package deal, of which only indefinite extension is considered to be a legally binding decision. But there's an understanding that without the others, we, we wouldn't have had a, a unanimous, no, no, it wasn't unanimous, but it was uh, a decision without a vote to extend the treaty indefinitely. The final element of that package was adopted a little later, is the resolution on the Middle East. Uh, the price of support for the indefinite extension uh, for Egypt in particular was achieving progress in establishing a zone free of nuclear weapons and other WMD in the Middle East, considering that Israel um, remained and to this day remains outside of the treaty. And so that, that the, the, the deal that they reached with uh, the United States and with, with Russia was that the three depositories would co-sponsor a resolution on the Middle East um, calling for progress on in, in establishing the zone. Next, please. Okay, we can skip that. This is just uh, the conference president, Jayanta Danapala, emphasizing this idea that indefinitely extending the treaty doesn't mean that we want to, uh, to extend the, the sort of imba imbalance and unfairness in obligations indefinitely. Extending the treaty indefinitely will also seek to um, increase the accountability. Okay, next, please. Okay, this is just on the Middle East resolution that uh, it calls for progress towards establishing uh, the zone. And, and because it came as sort of the package on indefinite extension, it became um, an essential part of the review process going forward. It's, it's a fixture in every NPT review, review meeting. And as I said before, it's often been crucial to achieving any kind of uh, outcome at the review conference. Next, please. Next important conference uh, was 2000. And, and that's, that's where we had, uh, the, I think the only instance when states parties negotiated a truly comprehensive final document and adopted by consensus, uh, both the review part, the backward looking and the forward looking part setting the agenda, uh, especially on nuclear disarmament. And that uh, agenda is known as the 13 practical steps. Uh, which includes uh, the phrasing of uh, the unequivocal undertaking by nuclear weapon states to eliminate their arsenals. It's calling for entry into force of the CTBT and maintaining uh, moratorium nuclear testing in the inter interim. Calls for negotiations of the cell material treaty within five years. Um, sadly, the track record of implementing all of these is, is not particularly good. Uh, CTBT is still not in force. FMCT negotiations have not begun. And, and some of the uh, other steps uh, are now overtaken by events like the um, step on upholding the anti-ballistic missile treaty and, um, uh, and uh, entry into force of start to bilateral arms control agreement between the US and Russia. So these, these steps are no longer implementable as phrased. Um, and so uh, US diplomats in particular have argued that they are simply irrelevant now and there's no need to uh, no point in you know reaffirming those, those past commitments but it's important to recognize that if even if steps themselves as worded are not something you can implement now the underlying issues uh, became very, very uh, remain very important be it ballistic missile defense and or or bilateral arms reductions so going to the 10th NPT review conference the question of those of past commitments and how to account for them, how to reaffirm, how to build upon them is, is, is very important. And it's good to remember that um, a lot of the issues underlying past decisions are, are remain topical. Um, it was also a very progressive document as far as support for safeguards goes. It, it throws full support behind model additional protocol that was concluded three years prior. Uh, and reaffirmed the importance of safeguards and the role of the IEA. Next, please. 2010 review conference was important because it came after a period of um, estrangement, basically, between non-nuclear weapon states and nuclear weapon states, between Western countries, between global north, global south, on, on a number of 
issues related to nuclear weapons, non-proliferation and disarmament. There was a crisis of trust between the two sides. Um, there was the period of US turning away from multilateralism, uh, attempts to reinterpret some of the treaty provisions, um, come up with more limitations, uh, whereas while also not making progress on, on arms control. So when uh, the Obama administration came in and, and turned US policy around in this regard, um, they, they also saw it important to have an outcome at the 2010 review conference. And this kind of political leadership and commitment is, is very important. If a, if, if a key country like the US goes into a conference saying, we don't really need an outcome document, the regime will survive, the treaty doesn't fall just because we didn't adopt something, um, then it kind of sets the tone that, that nobody's going to try very hard. Uh, on the contrary, if the country goes in and really throws its political weight, uh, in it and, and, and really works hard for the outcome, that it makes everyone else work, work harder. And here the key parties were the US with its interest in the outcome, Egypt who was chairing the non-aligned movement and saw it absolutely crucial to have progress, concrete progress on the Middle East subject. Uh, and, then, and then Russia actually played quite a constructive role uh, on, on looking for solutions on the Middle East subject. So we're, the result was that we did not agree on the review part. There was a lot of bad blood there, uh, but the conference did agree on the forward-looking action plan across all three pillars, but most importantly on disarmament uh, a, a part of the action plan and practical recommendations on the Middle East WMD free zone, which was the first time since 1995 that we had actual um, actionable steps on, on, this, on this subject. Um, and so implementation of the disarmament action plan and the Middle East recommendations was then crucial for the debates and outcome of the 2015 NPT review conference. Next, please. Uh, another uh, important uh, outcome of the 2010 that wasn't immediately obvious uh, was the, um, the, first, the, the fact that for the first time an NPT document referred to the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons and actually expressed deep concerns about um, the humanitarian consequence of any use of nuclear weapons. And that served as the basis for what is known as the humanitarian initiative. The conversation about, uh, not about sort of the state security, the strategic stability, but the actual impact of the use of nuclear weapons on, on humans. Uh, so the two tracks along which the humanitarian initiative developed were uh, the factual conferences talking about the impact of nuclear weapons and response capacities, and, um, and the political track, which was a series of joint statements by countries on the subject of the humanitarian impact, drawing on the conclusions of the conference and also taking the argument further. And they kind of converged on, on the, uh, on the uh, conclusion that there is, exists a legal gap in the international law where nuclear weapons uh, are the only weapons of mass destruction that have not been prohibited. Uh, and so countries like Austria committed to work towards this prohibition. Uh, and that all resulted in the negotiation of the Treaty on the Prohibition of uh, Nuclear Weapons in 2017. And I think uh, tomorrow or later today, you're going to have a session on that. Next, please. So 2015 review conference, as I mentioned, the, the key um, outcomes of 2010 were uh, disarmament action plan and the Middle East recommendations. And so progress on implementing those was key to the outcome of the 2015 conference and the progress on either wasn't, wasn't good. Um, and so disarmament debates were the center, centerpiece of the conference as far as one could observe. Uh, whereas the debates on the Middle East were mostly taking place behind the scenes with the US, Egypt and, and Russia trying to figure out a way forward, considering that uh, the key commitment of 2010 to hold a conference on the Middle East zone uh, in, by 2012 was not implemented. Uh, and ultimately that disagreement, Egypt on the one side, US on the other, Russia kind of playing on the, on the Arab state side, um, that, that's what formally brought the conference down. Um, the president of the conference included language in the final in document that she presented uh, that was agreeable to Egypt and Russia, but which the United States rejected. So that's how we 
I ended up without final documents. But that kind of masked the fact that there were very, very deep divisions among states parties on the question of disarmament, uh, and particularly the role of the humanitarian discourse and the need for a new legally binding instrument um, for disarmament, and specifically one that would prohibit nuclear weapons. So that debate was, was very uh, central to, to the conference, but the states were very close to actually adopting a kind of a wishy-washy document, uh, except for one part that it would have recognized the humanitarian discourse. Uh, but the question of the Middle East brought it, brought it down. And that brings us to the, to the current review cycle. Next, please. Um, the 2020 review cycle, what was supposed to culminate in, the, in 2020, but because of the pandemic, review conference was postponed a couple of times by now. So it's now tentatively scheduled for August 2021, which, uh, which actually gives some opportunity for, for improvement. Uh, but by and large, 2020 review cycle was one filled with uh, aggravation and anxiety. Um, we have the continued modernization of nuclear arsenals by nuclear weapon states, uh, deep crisis in arms control between US and Russia, uh, and related to that heightened perception of risk of nuclear weapons. You, you'll see a lot of pronouncements that the risk of use of nuclear weapons seems to be uh, highest it's been since the 80s at least. Um, I've already touched on the status of uh, past commitments. And um, added to that, we have the tensions between, uh, uh, between the United States and Iran in particular on the, uh, over the Iran deal. There's uncertainty, uncertainty about further steps on the Middle East uh, WMT free zone. Although the Arab states um, in between took the process to the UN General Assembly and got a decision to establish uh, a new process, uh, a series of conferences at the UN devoted to, to this subject. So in a sense that should take the pressure, some, some of the pressure off of the, of the NPT review process. Next please, and that would be the last one. Uh, we have um, also continued divisions over approaches to nuclear disarmament with supporters of the nuclear ban treaty uh, on the one side and supporters of this more gradual step-by-step -step approach on the other. Um, and uh, as I said, there's some chance for improvement with the advent of the new administration in the United States, which has already taken a very different approach to uh, nuclear uh, arms control, uh, has pronounced themselves uh, on the, the intent to rejoin the, the Iran deal, uh, but it's, it remains unclear what kind of position they're going to take on the status of past commitments under the NPT review conferences and how far they would be willing to go in, in updating those. I think I'll stop there. I hope I didn't go too long uh, and I'll be happy to engage your questions. Thank you, Margarita. Thank you, Gohar. Um, that was uh, really uh, very, very interesting. And I like uh, seeing the pictures. I mean, see a lot of old friends on, on there. So um, I was particular, enjoy the picture of, of uh, the, the group standing in the General Assembly and asking, do you know what's going on? Nope. Uh, I think most delegations would say that because these, uh, these meetings are, uh, are not very transparent. But I, I, I must say, I, uh, I want to just, before I ask Laura to give her presentation, make one observation and that, you know, there's a very sort of a pessimistic outlook on the, on the prospects for success uh, successful outcomes of NPT review conferences. Uh, I'm actually a little bit more optimistic uh, if the conference is held this year. And you know, as I say, one shell, swallow doesn't make spring, but I do think that, um, that given the change in the administration in the United States um, and the Biden, Biden Kamala administration, um, like Obama made a huge difference in 2010. And, and I think Hopefully, this will give a little bit of impetus uh, for, for other delegations to find ways to set aside their differences of focusing on their, on their um, the issues that they share. Um, but one of the critical issues in all of that is the implementation of safeguards in particular, a particular country. So, uh, Laura, uh, over to you. Unmute. And let me see if I can share my screen. God, it works <laughs> so far. 
so far. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for allowing me to join you. Um, I always uh, enjoy being a tag team with Gaukar. Every time I listen to her, I learn more about the NPT process. So um, although we think of the NPT as the cornerstone of the nuclear nonproliferation regime, which it is, the IAEA actually predated the NPT. And I'm going to uh, talk about the IAEA and its safeguards and break it up into uh, successively shorter periods of time, because I think it makes sense to understand how we got to where we are today. These things didn't just happen. They were responses to challenges to states' perception of their security and the threat to that security that was posed by nuclear weapons. Now, the first 25 years, you know, because you've had the background on this already, involved the first and let's hope the only use of nuclear weapons against a populated territory. Very, within 20 years, we had four more nuclear weapon states. And in the meantime, the creation of the International Atomic Energy Agency and its first safeguard system. So let's talk a little bit about what the tensions were at that time. People started seeing nuclear as a double-edged sword. We know we had just experienced what the two nuclear weapons did in the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But at the same time, people believed, many people believed that there were uh, peaceful uses that could be made of nuclear energy. Well, atomic rockets to the moon, maybe. Perhaps not nuclear powered cars, but who knows, maybe. So the idea was, if you are going to trade in nuclear technology, how do you make sure that this technology isn't used for weapons purposes? And that's exactly what happened in the first 25 years. How do you, there were only a handful of countries who had the technology. So how did they make sure that their materials that they traded in weren't misused? Well, they originally tried doing bilateral contracts with their uh, recipient countries, but that really didn't give a, a sufficient sense of security to the other countries in the world. So it was decided that not only would the suppliers exercise unilateral restraint on their own sharing, but collectively the countries would get together and create an international verification body that would be responsible for developing a system for making sure that supplied items weren't misused. So this resulted in the creation of the IAEA in 1957. So here in Vienna, Austria. Its mission, recognizing the dual nature of nuclear, was to accelerate and enlarge the contribution of atomic energy to peace, health and prosperity, while making sure that any involvement it has in the supply of nuclear technology is not used for nuclear weapons purposes. It is not uh, an, a UN body. It's an autonomous intergovernmental organization with a very special relationship with the Security Council. It has currently 172 member states, not exactly the same number of member states of the UN, but a great deal of overlap. And it was this statute that authorizes the agency to implement safeguards, this little orange book. I want to draw your attention to three critical provisions of the statute. Article 3A5 is the central piece of the statute that authorizes the agency to implement safeguards in three instances. One, if the agency becomes involved in the supply of a reactor. For example, when Ghana purchased a small uh, neutron source reactor from China, uh, the agency was asked to broker that deal. Now, in that instance, that is the only case because it gets involved in that supply where it can insist on acceptance of safeguards, which was a non-problem because Ghana was having safeguards anyway. But that's the only case in which the agency can demand safeguards. The other two instances in which the agency is permitted to apply safeguards are in response to bilateral or multilateral arrangements, such as the NPT or the Nuclear Weapon Free Zone Treaties, which by the way, didn't exist back in the 1950s when that little orange book was negotiated. So it was very prescient. The third area uh, of application of safeguards is to any of a state's nuclear activities if that state asks the agency to do so. Now, why would they do so? 
Largely, it was because the supplier state said, I'll sell you this technology, but not unless you ask the agency to apply safeguards to it, okay? So the three basis for application of safeguards derived from Article 3A5. Article 12 talks about what the drafters back in the 1950s thought safeguards would look like. On-site inspection by the agency, anytime, any place access, reporting and record keeping by the state, and what to do in the event of non-compliance. Now you'll see I've italicized any time, any place, because that's not actually the way safeguards work. But what it tells you is how fearful states were about the proliferation of nuclear weapons, that they would negotiate a treaty that would even contemplate such broad access by an international organization. Remember, this was the height of the Cold War. And the third most important article in the statute is the definition of nuclear material, source material and special fissionable material. And we'll touch on that later in this presentation to understand why that's an important distinction. Source material, natural uranium thorium, special fissionable material. I think you've already had lectures on nuclear weapons. It's the stuff that makes the fissile material uh, fiss out, plutonium and enriched uranium. So source and special fissionable material are nuclear material. So a couple of key points about safeguards you might not know. Just because your country is a member of the IAEA doesn't mean you have to accept safeguards. Secondly, um, the agency can apply safeguards in uh, countries that aren't members like North Korea, and even in a place that isn't a country, Taiwan, China. So the People's Republic of China permits the agency to implement safeguards in Taiwan, China, as if it were a state, because it perceives it to be in its security interest to do so. Now, fundamentally, what you need to know is the agency can't just walk into any country and demand safeguards. It requires the consent of the state. How does the state do that? Voluntarily, when South Africa dismantled and invited the agency to do much more than was routinely permitted under its safeguards agreement. Again, Libya, in effect, dismantling its WMD programs and allowing the agency very broad access to verify it. Security Council Chapter 7 action. Every country that becomes a member of the United Nations agrees in advance that if the Security Council asks them to do something under Chapter 7, they will do that. So it's kind of a prior consent. And this is the case of Iraq, for example. There are also a unique ad hoc sui generis arrangements like the JCPOA, the India deal, where a group of countries comes to the agency and says, would you please implement safeguards at, under these conditions? But mostly what the agency does is implement safeguards agreements. And there are three kinds. We have the very early item specific safeguards agreements uh, that used to be applied in a lot of countries. But after the NPT, um, more countries have comprehensive safeguards agreements. But there are three countries that still have these Indian item specific agreements. And we call them that because they only apply to the very specific items that are identified in that particular safeguards agreement. They are not non-proliferation agreements. They are simply, I promise not to misuse this equipment or material agreements, okay? Second category the agency has are what we call voluntary offer agreements. Galkar spoke about the definition of NPT nuclear weapon states. Under the NPT, these countries are not required to have safeguards agreements, but each one of them has concluded what we call a VOA or voluntary offer agreement because they are voluntary. Why? Share the burden. Mostly what the agency implements are what we now call comprehensive safeguards agreements or CSAs. We used to call them full scope safeguards. I can't remember when we stopped calling them that. It was roughly the early nineties and I don't remember why. Um, they are in force for 176 of the 186 non-nuclear weapon states, although it's not being implemented in North Korea, all right? So right now, the agency is implementing safeguards in 175 of these states, um, 
North Korea hasn't let the agency back in since 2009. Now, how did these agreements come into being? Well, they are negotiated between the state and the uh, agency. They're pretty standardized. The board has to approve them. They then have to be signed by the state or the states and the director general. And there are two ways they can enter into force, either on signature, which is not normal. The norm is upon receipt of notification by the agency of the state's requirements from entry into force having been satisfied. So when people talk about ratification, forget about it. Ratification doesn't matter under a safeguards agreement. It may be part of the domestic process, but it doesn't matter if they ratify it. It's not until they send a letter to the agency saying, we've done everything we need to do. And the day that agent, the agency receives that letter is the date that that agreement enters into force. But a state can choose to implement uh, a safeguards agreement or an additional protocol provisionally between signature and entry into force. And some states have indeed done that. So how do we make sure states don't misuse uh, nuclear material for weapons purposes? Well, currently there are two ways to get to a nuclear weapon, high enriched uranium, which the ore has to be dug up, converted and enriched, or you can get plutonium. So you have the Hiroshima weapon and the Nagasaki weapon. And luckily again, plutonium doesn't grow on trees. So you have to actually irradiate the nuclear material in a reactor, reprocess it and extract the plutonium. So why don't we just ban HEU and PU? Here's the problem. Both of those elements can be used in conventional civilian reactors as well. And of course, everybody knows there are lots of scientists that hang around the nuclear uh, research and development area. Um, and you know, it doesn't really involve nuclear material. So the, the focus was primarily on high enriched uranium and PU, sort of the critical choke points of the nuclear fuel cycle. The earlier item specific safeguards agreements, not so good, as I said, <clears throat> they're not non-proliferation agreements. So there are lots of gaps. Galkar mentioned the very first nuclear weapon free zone treaty in 1967, <clears throat> which was actually negotiated and open for signature before the NPT. Um, and uh, I think uh, if um, uh, Johan is, um, sorry, if Jean is going to talk about the Nuclear Weapon Free Zones Treaty, I'll leave that. So that was your first 25 years. We were trying to address the situation of supplied materials. And now it became clear that you needed something more because states were becoming more sophisticated, technologically more developed. And this is what triggered the negotiation of the NPT and the comprehensive safeguard system. This 20 years opens with the NPT entering into force the negotiation of IMSRC 153, which forms the basis for all comprehensive safeguards agreements. India testing its peaceful nuclear device, quote unquote. Uh, you have the development of export controls. Uh, Chernobyl happened. You have another nuclear weapon free zone treaty. So let's dive into this 20 years. What were the challenges? The challenge was with so many countries expanding their own domestic capabilities, how do we make sure that they don't use their own indigenous nuclear fuel cycle to make nuclear weapons? Well, you, des you design a safeguard system that allows the organization to verify not just the non-diversion of supplied materials, but produced nuclear material. And of course, the export controllers got together and decided maybe we should be a little bit careful about selling specialized technology. This resulted in the creation and the entry into force of the NPT. Galkar talked about the two categories. You'll see that the non-nuclear weapon states agree not to proliferate with respect to either nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices. Remember back in the day, peaceful nuclear explosions were thought to be a thing. Not so much anymore, but up until probably the mid 80s, late 80s, that was still a thing. So that's why the NPT prohibits nuclear weapons and other nuclear explosive devices. It does not prohibit all 
military uses of nuclear material. For example, nuclear powered submarines, okay? And the other requirement is that non-nuclear weapon states accept safeguards on all nuclear material. Now we didn't have a system to do that, so it had to be created. And this little blue book in CERC 153 uh, was negotiated by the member states of the IAEA, and it was instruction to the secretariat about what the structure and the content of these agreements should be. Most of the countries that are represented in this, uh, in this meeting now have comprehensive safeguards agreements. And your countries have agreed to accept safeguards on all source or special fissionable material in all peaceful nuclear activities on your territory, under its jurisdiction, or carried out under your control. Now, that doesn't mean you can take nuclear material and put it in a military activity and hide it. That would be illegal. You must declare all your nuclear material and your nuclear activities. And if you want to use nuclear material for a nuclear powered submarine, you sit down and have a conversation with the agency about how to make sure it doesn't get diverted, okay? Now, the agency's responsibility is to make sure that safeguards are indeed applied on all source or special fissionable material. Your basic obligations are to set up a system for accounting for and controlling nuclear material. Because if you don't know how much you have or where it is, you can't very well send those reports and uh, offer records to the IAEA and to give its inspectors access. And it's also part of the mutual cooperation that's required under the safeguards agreement. For its part, the agency's role is, and this is important, the timely detection of the diversion of significant quantities of nuclear material to the manufacture of nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices or for purposes unknown. Now this is, this whole, this paragraph could be a whole separate lecture in and of itself. Why significant quantity? Because back in the day, you couldn't make a nuclear weapon except if you had a lot of nuclear material, okay? The other aspect of this is important is the agency doesn't have to prove that you've diverted nuclear material to a nuclear weapon. If it just goes missing, the agency needs to be able to detect that. So if the agency is good at detecting the diversion of material, it is hoped that it will also deter diversion by the risk of early detection. Please keep in mind, uh, diversion can refer to either the use of declared nuclear material for prohibited purposes or failing to declare nuclear material and using it for prohibited purposes. Both of those are illegal, by the way. So back in the day, in order to encourage countries that had little or no nuclear activities to adhere to the NPT and have their safeguards agreement in force, the member states got together and said, let's offer them an opportunity to suspend most of the safeguards provisions in the agreement. And so if you had below certain quantities of nuclear material and no nuclear material in a nuclear facility, you could conclude an SQP, a small quantities protocol, which suspended most of your reporting and access requirements. What it doesn't suspend, obviously, is your obligation not to divert. Uh, you also need to establish your SSAC and report annually if you do import or export nuclear material, okay? Um, routine safeguards coverages by the end of the 20 years, we thought we were doing pretty well. We had most of the gaps in the nuclear fuel cycle uh, uh, accounted for. So what happens if the agency in trying to verify a state's initial declaration says, uh, we really need access to some additional locations and some additional um, information. And the state goes, nah, nah, I'm not gonna give it to you because, oh, it's military and it's not related to nuclear. Well, if the secretary can't convince the state to do that, it can go to the board and say, dear board, we believe this action is essential and urgent. If the board decides that is essential and urgent, the state becomes legally obliged to, to take that action. It's kind of like a chapter seven action under the secure, uh, UN Charter. Now, let's say the state turns around and goes, no, 
still not going to give you that access or that information. Well, the secretariat can go back to the board and say, dear board, the agency is unable to verify that there has been no diversion of nuclear material. In such a case, the board may ask the director general to report the non-compliance to the Security Council. And it's done that only in a handful of situations. Um, Iraq, North Korea, uh, Romania. Um, ah, I'm coming up short on the other three. Iran, uh, Libya, and I think Syria. So just a handful of occasions. Um, but that's when you talk about what the agency can do. It's not really an enforcement arm. It's a detection arm. Okay, But already at the end of that period, we were looking at the ways we had limitations on traditional safeguards. Routine access was limited to where we could go and how frequently. Nobody seemed to be worried about small quantities of nuclear material. We really were focused on declared materials, um, so the correctness of a state's declaration, but not so much the absence of undeclared nuclear material and facilities, what we refer to as completeness. Well, this changed after the war in Iraq. Iraq invaded um, Kuwait in 1990, just as the NPT review conference was opening in Geneva. Um, and this is when we got serious about strengthening safeguards. This is only 10 years. And this period covers not just 91 to 97, which was the period where we really strengthened safeguards, but um, the in initial implementation of the model additional protocol. So let's dive right into this. Um, before 1991, this is what we saw in Iraq. This was a site called Tuwaitha, not too far from Baghdad, where we went twice a year to visit three facilities and a lock. This is kind of like a small city. Well, after the Security Council resolution mandated access that we got, you can imagine our surprise when we saw just within Tuwaitha alone, almost everything from soup to nuts of a nuclear weapons program. What did they use? Very small quantities of nuclear material. What kind of equipment did they have? They went shopping for dual use material, brought it back to Iraq and created their own single use equipment. They had very bright scientists. So all of a sudden states started going, hmm, what do we do about undeclared material and activities? Let's make sure that we can verify all nuclear material, whether declared or undeclared. And again, the export controllers separately got busy working on export controls to dual use items. So we went back to the board and said, well, board, we actually do have the authority to do this under your safeguards agreement. Paragraph two says the agency's right and obligation extends to all source or special fissional material. And the board said, well, then why aren't you doing it? Um, and it was probably because we were learning as we were going and um, it wasn't entirely clear up until that point whether states would support the agency exercising that right. Well, Iraq got their attention and they came back to the secretariat and said, we need assurances of correctness and completeness of a state's declarations. So over a period 91 to 97, many things happened. We uncovered Iraq's nuclear weapons program, taking a look at the time. Um, we concluded a quadripartite safeguards agreement with Argentina, Brazil, and ABAC, which was a plus. Uh, South Africa dismantled its nuclear weapons, also a plus. And North Korea uh, concluded its safeguards agreement and we started verifying its initial declarations when they kicked us out and then concluded the agreed framework with the US. But in the meantime, we also negotiated, oh, there was another good news. 1996, the African Nuclear Weapon Free Zone Treaty was opened for signature. And I'll leave that to Jean to go into in depth because I think we have little time. Uh, but what we did is we started strengthening safeguards. We went to the board and we said, there are some things that we can already do under the existing safeguards agreements, access to undeclared locations, environmental sampling, uh, satellite imagery evaluation, looking at the state as a whole instead of individual facilities. But we said, if we had this additional authority for more information, broader access, and some simplified administrative procedures, 
we think we could do that job better. And that's when we created the model additional protocol. Another little blue book negotiated by the member states of the agency, but this one is actually a model protocol as opposed to an instruction to the secretariat. What's new? Additional information about all parts of the nuclear fuel cycle, not just nuclear material and nuclear facilities. A new type of access. We don't call it inspection, we call it complementary access. Short notice, not uh, uh, no notice inspections, except in rare occasions, but access to places beyond nuclear material and facilities and some simplified administrative measures to make the job easier. What is not new is the agency's right to carry out unannounced inspections, which it can do under your CSA. It's right to request access to undeclared locations, same thing, can do it under both instruments. And importantly, the agency's right to verify correctness and completeness stems from the safeguards agreement itself, not the additional protocol. Okay, we're home free. No more, ver no more uh, proliferation. We've covered the whole thing, right? Not so fast. 9-11, 2001. When planes flew into the Twin Towers of New York and in the Pentagon in Washington, DC, um, we were convening in the Board of Governors that afternoon at three o'clock when the second plane hit. The interesting thing about that was at the time we were discussing the agenda item on um, strengthening the physical protection, the, the Convention on the Physical Protection of uh, Nuclear Material to determine whether it should be expanded to facilities. Imagine if those had been uh, spent fuel ponds in a reactor or an enrichment facility or a reprocessing plant and to extend beyond simply domestic activities by a state. These were non-state actors and these were international terrorists. So it really drove home the distinction that we need to be worried, not just about states, but non-state actors. And, um, and we need to worry about things that aren't just nuclear material. So this is again, less than 10 years, the new millennium. And I will go through some of these key, but you can see highlighted in yellow, there are so many important events that happen uh, Iraq, we're in and back out. DPRK announces withdrawal from the NPT. Discovery of Iran's undeclared enrichment programs. Libya's nuclear weapons program. Uh, UN gets involved in non-state actors. So let's uh, move forward. What were we now worried about? Not just state actors, but non-state actors. And what if those planes had had non-fissile material? What if they had had a bunch of cobalt 90 sources on it, radiological dispersal devices? So what the states realized is they needed to improve the physical security of nuclear material and facilities and other radioactive materials and make sure that they were not only having domestic controls, but trans-border controls. So here's a slide that I think will be useful for you to understand the difference between safe, nuclear safeguards and nuclear security. Nuclear safeguards are about the detection and deterrence of diversion of nuclear material, source of special fissionable material by a state. Nuclear security is the detection and deterrence of the misuse of nuclear material and other radioactive substances by non-state actors, okay? So another seven years of all hell breaking loose, we have uh, our uh, many visits to the Security Council uh, to discuss the situation in Iraq. Uh, Hans Blix used to be our Director General at that time, Mohammed El Bardai was his successor. You may recognize this gentleman as Colin Powell, and you may not recognize me sitting behind uh, Mohammed El Bardai. Here's Ali Hainonen. Uh, this is when we first started uh, having disagreements with Iran about their failure to declare certain nuclear material and activities. You had the discovery of Libya's uh, incipient weapons of mass destruction program. Here is their governor signing their additional protocol. Um, I hope 
All of you know who this gentleman is, A.Q. Khan, and I'm pretty sure he's not teaching his physics students how to play football. Uh, then you have this uh, reactor, uh, this building formerly known as a reactor in the desert of Syria that was destroyed by Israel. Uh, again, we were back into North Korea and back out and haven't been back since 2009. But we did a few things in the meantime. Um, we took a look at the SQP and said, dear board, we think we can strengthen that a little bit too. Um, and they agreed because it's a weakness in safeguards, but they thought it was still useful to have SQPs. So they changed your eligibility for it. Now you're entitled if you have small quantities of nuclear material and no existing or planned nuclear facility. It still suspends much of the obligations, but it reinstates the obligation to provide an initial report to the agency and to permit the agency to verify um, the completeness of it and give early information on any decision to construct the nuclear facility. Um, I've included this slide in here because I will share these with you afterwards. So. I noticed that uh, some of your countries still have the old SQP, and I wanted to compare it with the impact of the revised SQP. It's easy enough to revise it, just write a letter to the agency and then make it happen. Uh, I have to put this one in here. 2005, Mohamed El Baradai and the IAEA won the Nobel Peace Prize, which I attended with Selma Hayek and Bob Geldof, my favorite picture. Okay, this is nine years, the recent past. Um, we've seen the nuclear security summits, Syria reported to the council, the new Iran deal, the ban treaty, which is just entering into force today or tomorrow. Unfortunately, the US withdraws from the JCPOA and let's see, we have some challenges, some new, some old. What do we do about nuclear black markets? What do we do about weaponization activities? During this period, there were lots of challenges to the agency's authority and, and there's been a disarmament slowdown. Is, it, is this a failure of the nuclear weapon states to fulfill their Article 6 obligations? 2013, 2018, we finally found a solution to the Iran problem with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action and the IAEA's roadmap for clarification. Um, Security Council uh, adopted it, endorsed it. Um, the past and present outstanding issues were addressed in 2015, implementation day in January, 2016, and much to my personal dismay, in May, 2018, the US withdrew from the JCPOA. And we have North Korea. We went from 2017 of fire and fury to BFFs uh, just a year or so later, but we seem to be back at square one. So. Where are we now? Well, 2020, the coronavirus. Our NPT review conference postponed. North Korea destroys the joint liaison office. What are our current challenges? A lot. JCPOA, North Korea. What do we do about emerging and hybrid technologies? Collapse of the nuclear arms control regime? Maybe with the new US administration, will we cover some lost ground? And I am certain the coronavirus is going to have a significant impact on state relations. So today's regime isn't really a single thing. It's a patchwork quilt of disarmament, security, NPT, safeguards, uh, security assurances, safety. And the tighter the fabric of that quilt is woven, the harder it is for a state to sneak out and to create a nuclear weapons program. So if this is today's regime, I ask you what will tomorrow's regime be because you're going to be the ones in charge of it. So I hope it didn't take too long and I hope you enjoyed that uh, presentation. Thank you, Laura. That was certainly very interesting. Uh, and as you can probably see from the Q and A, there is a, a large number of questions that uh, already popped up. So uh, what I'm going to do, I've, I've communicated with several of the participants to ask them if they wish to ask their questions live. So what mm -hmm. I, Laura, since and I, uh, on behalf of Gohar, have to apologize, she had to leave. 
Uh, oh. And uh, she has a family commitment, and um, so we understand that it's, uh, as you know, late in Vienna already. So um, I think a lot of the questions also relate to to safeguards, and, and you are certainly well qualified to answer any of the questions. I will pop in uh, to address some of them uh, if, if that's helpful. So um, there are a, a number of questions, and I, I can um, read them. Uh, to you uh, and to other participants. So what I will do is I will maybe we take uh, five or six questions if you want to respond and we go on. I'll so, um, you know, I think the the first question by Nesrin Melat, uh, she has two, two questions. Um, why is the Middle East the chosen area of the WD free zone? Um, and does the treaty allow uh, the, the uh, NPT to check whether a given country possesses weapons of mass destruction. She referenced the Bush administration's invasion of Iraq due to Iraq's, they claim that Iraq possessed uh, uh, WMD. I think you are very well qualified to answer that. Um, then another uh, good question from um, Rose, you, you kind of touch on that. The NPT is an important document to improve nuclear security and safety, but why is it not enforced on every nation? Um, Bushra Bustani asks, um, and this is slightly uh, it's related to, to safeguards, of course, what kind of topic should be addressed in the future fissile material treaty? Um, and uh, this is maybe more specific, but I think your experience in North Korea, you can uh, address this as an anonymous, anonymous attendee. What should be the best approach to solve North Korea's nuclear uh, and ballistic threats? <laughs> if uh, I know the answer to that one, they'll give me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and um, then let's take one more. Um, uh, are there any consequences for a nation when it uh, withdraws or violates the NPT? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you want to maybe start with those and then we'll take another round. Okay. Um, so why... It's not so much to address, I think it was Nasima's uh, question, it's not so much that the Middle East was chosen. It's that uh, the Middle East has uh, countries that have been perpetually at war and conflict with one another, only one of which is not party to the NPT. And so um, I believe that the Arab countries see uh, pressing Israel, they see Israel's non-adherence to the NPT um, as a thorn in their side, and they would like to see the US press Israel to become party to the NPT. And so the NPT becomes sort of the, the whipping boy in the middle. Um, it's, it's because the actors involved in here have been very successful at bringing the Middle East into the NPT, even though Israel is not party to the NPT. They have also been successful in expanding it beyond nuclear weapons free zone to weapons of mass destruction. And I think that was a matter of compromise. Um, and it was, and I wasn't party to the compromise, but it's not that it was chosen, it's that it was the NPT became a convenient mechanism for applying pressure to Israel and to the United States to get Israel to join the NPT. I don't happen to see it happening anytime soon, but you can, um, you know, the, the arguments that are made one way and the other are, are interesting and would require a whole separate lecture. Does the NPT allow, I assume you mean the IAEA, to check on the absence of WMD? All the NPT allows the agency to do is to verify compliance with a state's safeguards agreement. And that is with respect to nuclear material. It has no jurisdiction over chem or bio, which we'll hear later from Rich. It's just nuclear material. And in my view, yes, the safeguards agreement does permit the agency to uh, check for the absence of nuclear material used in a nuclear weapon or a nuclear explosive device. In my mind, it's unequivocal. It's not so much the NPT that does that, but it is the safeguards agreement itself. Um, the NPT doesn't actually address nuclear security or nuclear safety. And if you look really closely into the IA statute, it talks about safety, but the addressing nuclear security is more implied. 
And I think the reason it, that safeguards has become more a regulatory and accepted as something mandatory and security and safety are more, you know, let's just do the right thing is because states have jealously protected their domestic rights to control those aspects. They believe it is the state's right and responsibility. IAEA should stay out of that. So um, it's a function of what the states want the agency to do, um, not a function of whether the agency uh, can in a physical sense. Um, so thus far, safeguards are the only, uh, in, in safeguards, safety and security, safeguards is the only one where the agency has the authority to, um, to uh, implement a, more of a regulatory uh, role in those countries. FMCT, big question is a fissile material cutoff treaty. Is it just a cutoff treaty? And so these states that have stockpiles of fissile material can keep those? Or is it a fissile material treaty which requires states to fess up to all of their stockpiles of fissile material so that you know exactly whether a state is producing, uh, using fissile material to produce nuclear weapons or not. That's one of the key uh, things. Definitely has to be involved verification and I think it would be IAEA verification. Um, in fact, uh, many years ago, we actually looked into applying safeguards. What would be expected under FMCT is fundamentally what the agency does under comprehensive safeguards agreements and additional protocols. So it's not a big leap uh, conceptually to do it for the nuclear weapon states. The problem with the nuclear weapon states is that interface between your civilian and your military programs. And that is sensitive, but we're light years away from that now, unfortunately. I wish I had a solution to the North Korea problem. Um, I just convened a meeting today of my new organization, our engagement network to talk about how can we engage the North Koreans? I think we have to engage them in a respectful way. We have to stop underestimating them. And I think there need to be quiet conversations. But something that one of my uh, participants pointed out today is uh, it's clear that the North Koreans are anxious for the Biden administration to do something. And Kim Jong-un might feel compelled to go stomp his foot and be provocative. But um, just as um, the US has been applying, uh, what is it? Uh, something patience, I've forgotten the, the expression for it. But Kim Jong-un should expect that for the US right now, there are so many other priorities. Uh, for North Korea, North Korea is the priority. In the United States, you have the, the pandemic, you have the, you know, the invasion of the capital, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think it is high on his agenda, but the domestic issues are much higher. I don't have an answer. I do hope it will involve international verification. Um, I do hope it will eventually lead to denuclearization, but I don't think that's going to happen soon. And it probably is going to have to be step by step, uh, trust building and confidence building measures. Um, are there consequences to withdrawing from or non-compliance with the NPT? Well, yain, yes and no. Uh, Iraq's non-compliance with the NPT ended up pretty badly for Iraq. Uh, North Korea, when we first reported their non-compliance to the NPT, the Security Council did almost nothing. So as I said, there can be consequences, there cannot be, but uh, the consequences have to really extend, be extended by the Security Council, because the only thing the agency can do is stop sharing technical assistance. And how threatening is it to a state that wants to acquire a nuclear weapon that they'd be cut off from IAEA technical assistance? Not so much. So the consequences, sometimes yes, sometimes no, and that be, depends on the political will of the member states of the UN Security Council. What next? <laughs> Bring them on. Yeah, that was that was great. Um, I um, I've asked uh, Stacy uh, Achoki, uh, Charles uh, Manguba, and um, Nana to ask their questions live. Stacy, I think your first question was already answered by 
by uh, Laura, but uh, why don't you go ahead and, and ask your question and I will ask a few more after the three of you ask your question. Go ahead, Stacey. My first question was answered. So the second question was, with the resumption of the US to the JCPOA, will there be any consequences for violation of the regional deal? And with the deal with, that, with the Biden administration include any new clauses? Charles, do you want to go ahead with yours and, and then I'll, I'll take all three of them together? Uh, Charles? Ah, I just saw Elaine's on board. Yeah, <laughs> I will talk about it. Uh, so I'll ask Charles's question. Uh, okay. Are there safeguards for nuclear industry without military intention? Um, and there's another one from Nizreen Malat. Uh, so how many safeguards are implemented in a given country, for example, in China? And how's it, how does that number depend on specific criteria? Um, Nana, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, I do. Go ahead. Uh, actually, all right. Um, thank you. My question actually was for the first speaker, so I actually have like two questions for you, Lars, if you may. Um, the first question it's um, on internal breach. How can one tackle you know, the internal breach of security and safeguard of nuclear or radioactive materials within a nuclear power plant, whether they are radioactive waste or nuclear materials that have been declared or non declared? And then the second question is um, I don't know, perhaps it's from my own view, and um, perhaps some people also see it that way. Why um, is it that it's mostly countries in the East? or maybe is that uh, being, you know, put forward to declare that nuclear weapons as against perhaps the US, Russia, Israel, and North Korea. I don't know, it seems like more emphasis is on the East, so Middle East countries and less on other countries. That is if those other countries in the West or Northern Europe have actually already declared yes. So I actually want to understand why it's mostly countries in the East that are being, you know, Put forward to declare their weapons. Um, the third question which is supposed to be for the first speaker is actually if there's some threat being faced by some countries, you know, about having to possess nuclear weapons, why can't they be like a mutual understanding or agreement on non-use of these weapons rather than attacking each other or invading each other's countries to cause havoc or threats on in innocent individuals? you know, and all those sorts of attempts. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I, I have to admit, I, uh, Jean, if you could repeat those questions. My, I think my sound system is not very good. I, I missed a lot of what Nana asked. Yeah, um, I, I couldn't, couldn't hear either. The one question that she posted, she said, how should nuclear uh, power plants tackle internal breaches of security and safeguards of radioactive material? Awesome. Okay, that one's that one's pretty easy because that's really a nuclear security question. And uh, are you, I hope you have somebody who's speaking about nuclear security during this week, uh, because if you do, internal threats is really about nuclear uh, security rather than safeguards. Of course, you don't want anybody internally or externally stealing nuclear material, but um, you want to make sure you have good nuclear materials accountancy and good physical structures. I didn't understand your second question. It was about declaring nuclear weapons. Actually, uh, right now there's no treaty that requires, sorry, that's not true. There may be some arms control treaties among the nuclear weapon states that require certain declarations, but under your safeguards agreement, there's no requirement to declare nuclear weapons. Uh, in your non-nuclear weapon state, you're not supposed to have them. And in the nuclear weapon states, they carve out their military programs from safeguards. I'm pretty sure that doesn't answer your question because I think yours was a more thoughtful question than that. But apologies that I couldn't hear it. It had something to do with Eastern countries and I, I don't quite get the connection. If we have time, maybe we can come back to that. Um, how many safeguards are applied in, in countries and are they criteria driven? Um, in every country where the agency implements safeguards, it's a single safeguards agreement, except in 
Pakistan. India now has a single safeguards agreement. Pakistan has three or four. But in every other country where safeguards are applied, it's a single safeguards agreement that applies in the case of a comprehensive safeguards agreement to all of the nuclear material and facilities in the country. In the case of the nuclear weapon states, and China is one of those, um, they offer some or all of their civilian nuclear facilities for safeguards. If I'm not mistaken, the currently the agency implements safeguards at one or two nuclear facilities in China. Um, and yes, there are certain basic criteria <coughs> that are used to verify the non-diversion of declared nuclear material at declared facilities. And there are slightly different criteria or objectives the agency tries to achieve in looking for undeclared nuclear material and activities in non-nuclear weapon states. We do not look for undeclared nuclear material in the nuclear weapon states. Um, wasn't quite sure about Charles's question about safeguards for the nuclear industry. Yes, <laughs> yes. I think safeguards uh, is a question of, um, uh, it's good for business. I think safeguards are good for business. If a nuclear industry, industry says, I'm doing great safeguards, I'm doing everything my country asked me to do, um, it, can only, it can only look better for them. It's a question of reputation, reputational responsibility. But remember, it's the state's responsibility to make sure industry implements safeguards, okay? So if something goes wrong with safeguards, the agency goes after the country, not the nuclear facility or the nuclear operator. And finally, Stacy, resumption of the JCPOA. I really hope the US rejoins. I think it's going to be more difficult than we would like it to be. Um, and I personally would be happy if we could just go back to square one. I don't think that's going to be possible, either from the Iranian perspective or from the American perspective. Uh, I think the Iranians feel as though they have complied up until the point where, you know, they were bit by bit non-compliant after the U.S. withdrew. And I think you see uh, the JCPOA wasn't all that popular on Capitol Hill in the United States. So Biden's hands might be a little bit tied. So I think it's not going to be easy to just go back to square one with the JCPO, JCPOA. I don't think the, uh, the Iranians will consider, even consider negotiating ballistic missiles. I, I just don't see that happening. But um, hopefully we'll have uh, good negotiators on both sides so we can find a way to creep, creep our way back into the JCPOA with as little damage as possible. And that's tough because Iran has been badly damaged by the US withdrawal and the US sanctions. I think I only got about 70% of those questions in there, but um, let's do another round. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. We are, we are running against time. So I will maybe, I will read uh, maybe two or three more questions. Um, this one is, is uh, I think, important for, for several countries in, in Africa. What's the importance of concluding the additional protocol with countries that, uh, you know, have only a small amount of nuclear material? I think that's an important question. Um, mm -hmm. Can you also explain why bilateral agreements uh, are not enough? Um, and uh, then there was uh, one that you kind of alluded to already about the, the, um, the consequences um, of, of uh, non-compliance um, of uh, you know the safeguard. So maybe those three questions, and then you know we will other questions we will address uh, uh, directly. Uh, perhaps if you wish to respond to them as well. But um, if you want to quickly address those three, okay. First of all, I think you should conclude an additional protocol because I was one of the original drafters of the additional protocol. So I think you should conclude an additional <laughs> protocol. <laughs> no, all kidding aside, I, I believe there are significant reasons for doing it. One, it demonstrates to the global community that you are prepared to accept the best possible verification standards that exist. And not because you're worried about yourself or your country, but it holds other countries to that standard. It is easier to get countries who might be more resistant, who might be more problematic, to, uh, it might be harder for them to stay away from an additional protocol. So I think it creates kind of a critical mass of pressure on the countries that 
uh, aren't don't appear to be willing to conclude an additional protocol. So it's good for your country and it's good for global security because it demonstrates to the world that I have nothing to hide and I'm not worried about me and I want to make sure all my neighbors and my non neighbors accept that same standard. So it is, uh, we did a study on that when I was at the VCDMP and the initial implementation of the ad additional protocol. Yeah, it's a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, a little bit of money, but on an ongoing basis for a, a small country with little or no nuclear activities, very, very, uh, very non-invasive. It's it, There are very few additional uh, obligations once the first declarations are out of the way. Um, why weren't bilateral agreements enough? Well, look at it this way. Uh, the United States was perfectly happy to conclude treaties with its allies, but do you think it made that their allies wouldn't make nuclear weapons? But do you think that satisfied the Soviet Union and their allies? No, what they wanted was more, uh, less, uh, less opportunity for uh, collaboration, you know, and saying, oh, I know my ally wouldn't develop nuclear weapons, wink, wink, nod, nod. So I think what states decided was collectively having bilateral agreements between two countries here, two countries there, first of all, wasn't sufficiently secure and didn't give a broad enough coverage. So I think that's why countries moved from bilateral uh, safeguards to an international safeguards verification system. Consequences of non-compliance, um, as I said, they can be as uh, onerous as what happened to Iraq, um, or it could be um, very little. Um, there's, uh, it, it's largely the most common sanctions are, are financial sanctions, that sort of thing. Um, it's rare to have military action. Thankfully, I think uh, Iraq was really an example of a military uh, action. I hope that doesn't happen again. Uh, but uh, the case of non-compliance in North Korea was so badly handled that now North Korea effectively has X number of nuclear weapons. So maybe that's something states have tried to struggle with over the years. Should they establish a template? If you do X, then this will happen to you. If you do Y, then that will happen to you. But it is so hard to anticipate the variety of creative ways that countries might want to try to not comply that I think that route's a little bit difficult. But I think we dropped the ball on North Korea, not we the IAEA, we the Security Council. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and I think we've kind of gone over our time, but I'd like to thank you very much for um, your, not only your good presentation um, and also an absentia to Gohar, uh, but especially for answering the questions very comprehensively. Uh, and I have fond memories of sitting in that very dining room table of you being served your wonderful bullet bay some years ago when we were, my wife and I were there. So thank you very much. Good to see you again. Um, you. And so I would also like to recognize Ambassador Elaine White and welcome her uh, to yeah. the course. Um, many questions, Elaine, have been uh, asked about the, the relationship between the TPNW and the NPT, uh, and I kind of suggested to participants that uh, the world's foremost expert on the TPNW will be in the next session and that they should sharpen their questions for you. So um, uh, we look forward to your, um, your participation uh, in the next session. I'd like now, to- say, May I say yes, good night, goodbye. And Elaine, congratulations, huh? Yeah. Hi. Very nice to see you, Laura. I am sorry I was not able to listen to all your presentation. I should, I'm, I'm sure I would have learned a lot. Uh, but I, it's very nice to see you. Thank you. You too. And best wishes and congratulations again, Elaine. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank uh, thanks, Laura. Um, the next uh, our presenter, and Rich, I uh, apologize that uh, we, uh, you had to wait a bit, Dr. Rich Pilch. Uh, Rich, if you are still there, we go ahead. Please. Do you want to take a break, Sean, or you want to just uh, plow through? Let's roll into this. Uh, then we'll take a break after your. Um, so if, if, if I may suggest that if you can uh, kind of keep it to about 25 minutes or so, and then we can uh, take Q&A. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you again. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, I, I too learned a, a ton from the previous sessions and I'll, I'll try to tie those in. Uh, 
my lessons from those sessions in as I talk here. Um, please, someone just shout out if you can't see my slides. Um, otherwise, we'll just get going. So the topic I was asked to speak on is uh, chemical and biological weapons controls uh, and specifically non-proliferation and disarmament. Uh, so I'm going to try to keep this even shorter than 30 minutes. I originally planned on talking about 30 minutes. Um, but there are just a few key points I want to try to hit on, and, and this is going to be quite a, a different type of presentation uh, than the previous ones. So the first is I want to just talk about, uh, I know you received a, a, a talk yesterday from my colleague, Joe Luster. I apologize I wasn't able to see it, but um, to the extent that she went into the actual proliferation pathways uh, for biological and chemical weapons, really determines a lot of what we can do to control those pathways. So we'll just talk briefly about pathways um, and then uh, how we break those pathways down into specific building blocks for a biological or chemical weapon, uh, and then how we can control those building blocks. And then I'll, I'll just do a quick case study and hopefully wrap up early. Uh, but so let's just start with the picture at the bottom of this slide. So what this picture is supposed to show uh, is that there is a, uh, a capability pathway uh, from a biological or chemical weapon that starts with a country that's, that is just getting interested in the idea of maybe using a biological weapon. Let's say they've seen the effects of COVID-19 and they say, well, we might want this capability. That's, that's where engagement starts. We want to keep people from gaining an interest and in pursuing a biological or chemical weapon. But then there's a process of building a capability before there ever is a weapon that can be used that typically goes through three very simplified steps. The first is acquiring the biological or chemical material. So from a biological standpoint, we talk about pathogens, um, an individual biological agent that can then be grown into multiple. Uh, for, from a chemical weapons perspective, we talk about precursor chemicals primarily. Um, there are also bulk chemical weapons from former programs we'll mention briefly, but acquisition is the first step. Uh, then your next step is to take that small amount and make it into a large amount, right? So you have enough for a weapon. And then uh, your third step, again, simplified is you make it into a form that you can actually deliver it as a weapon. Now, all that leads up to what is de depicted here as the little explosion, right? That's what we call um, you know, your, your boom. Um, and then there's a whole lot of stuff that you do, whether it's chemical or biological after that, which we are now, uh, you know, under natural circles going through with, with COVID-19. Um, so what I want to try to um, express early is this entire pathway is got, it has a pre-boom element or a post-boom element. And we won't talk about post-boom at all today, even though a lot of what I do is post-boom, managing events once they happen, early warning, detection, um, how you do crisis management, how you do consequence management, how you attribute, attribute an event. Everything we're going to be talking about is pre-boom. And that's actually okay because from an investment standpoint, your return on investment is much greater if you get involved before it ever happens. You know, again, using the natural outbreak example of COVID as, as our our sort of measuring stick here. We should have spent billions of dollars up front to keep it from happening rather than hundreds of billions of dollars that we're now spending to try to deal with the consequences is the general idea. So while we are talking about biological and chemical weapons, and those are two very different things. And as John mentioned in the introduction, I'm, I'm much more of a bio person than a chem person. Just I, my background, I'm a medical doctor uh, and I focus mainly on biological issues for my career. Um, but what I wanna get across, and it's very actually similar to nuclear as well, is that the pathways that I discussed early are sort of the same for both. So if you understand just the general steps of the pathway, you're okay. Uh, in the bio sense, you can acquire the biological agent that starts everything. Once you make a decision to pursue a capability from generally two places, you can acquire them from labs where the biological agents already are, and those can be government labs uh, industry labs, academic labs. Um, there are, are what we call culture collections, which are actually resource labs that have specimens of every uh, biological agent um, 
and that, so we can use them for comparison purposes. So labs, uh, and then the environment, biological agents, they grow in the environment, right? So if you know how to collect them, if you know where to find them, uh, the picture here is of collecting a specimen from a bat, um, which bats harbor uh, hemorrhagic fever viruses like Ebola, they harbor coronaviruses. Uh, so, you know, important uh, source of potential biological agents that could be used as a weapon, uh, right? From a, um, a proliferation perspective, historically looking at um, state programs, but really primarily looking at then how uh, terrorists get their hands on weapons, um, because that's an important consideration. Over 95% of attempted acquisitions have come from the laboratory route. Uh, it's very difficult, uh, but it has been tried on numerous occasions uh, by organizations to try to collect specimens from the actual uh, wild and then develop them as weapons. And again, that's primarily from a terrorist standpoint. Um, this is a broad scope presentation, so we're just talking in simplicities. Um, once you have the biological agent, then you need to grow it. So there's two ways you do that. It depends on whether it's a bacteria or a virus. If it's a bacteria, you use something called fermenters. Um, and you, uh, the top picture depicts Soviet scale fermenters. I'll talk about it later in a case study where you just grow a lot of something like anthrax, a bacterial agent. Uh, the bottom picture shows how you do Soviet scale uh, growth of a virus. Now viruses, we think of them as they're alive, but it's easier to think of them as just like a piece of your child's Lego sitting on the ground. It doesn't do anything until you step on it and it hurts your foot, right? Viruses can't do anything to a, a, an animal or a human unless they get inside of us because they don't have the machinery to do anything. They don't have the machinery to produce their bad effects or to reproduce themselves. Once they get inside your body, um, then uh, they can grow and have their deleterious effects. So from a weapons perspective, what that means is you can't grow it the way you would grow bacteria, which is just put it in a happy environment, something called media, where it's got all sorts of nutrients and let it grow like in the top picture. What you need is a specialized approach to growing it. And one of the main ways to do that is to grow it inside embryonated eggs. So uh, what you're seeing here, this yellow line of what looks like um, washing machines is actually um, a bunch of uh, egg incubators. And what uh, was being done here was smallpox virus was being injected into the eggs. And then as the eggs produced, the virus grew and then the eggs would be drained and there would be a large amount of virus. Okay, so that's step two, production from a biological standpoint. Step three, delivery. So you can deliver a biological agent typically by three approaches. Uh, the first is uh, injection, which is, you know, putting it through someone's skin into their body. And so the classic example is the bottom picture of a famous assassination case in the late 1970s, where an umbrella was used to inject a pellet underneath someone's skin. That pellet had holes carved in it and inside was a biological toxin, um, which is slightly different from a biological agent, but for the purpose of this discussion, we don't need to distinguish it. And the, the hole where the biological toxin was inserted was then sealed with wax. Once the pellet was underneath the person's skin, uh, the body heat melted the wax, the toxin leaked out, and it affected the person and, and, and killed him. Uh, so injection is the first way. The second way, if we shift to the top, uh, is ingestion is your second way of delivering a biological agent. Uh, Foodborne sabotage, waterborne sabotage. And the two little pictures there are just two sort of historical examples where Biological agents were used to contaminate muffins in one case uh, and a salad bar in another case. And that those are um, those are US examples of terrorist events, or well, one is a terrorist event and one is defined as a criminal event, but where people actually used biological agents to, to cause illness. And then the middle two pictures are the one we really worry about and the one where the technology controls come into play, which is disbursement by aerosol. Uh, and so the top picture is just a wake up to today's realities where we have drones flying around that can easily uh, deliver and are equipped to deliver um, aerosol versions of biological agents all the time in this picture for, uh, for the purpose of spreading a pesticide. Um, and uh, they can be diverted to the use or development of a biological or development and delivery of a biological weapon. The picture beneath that is 
something called an aerosol test chamber, which is how you test whether the aerosol you've made actually causes infection. And what's, what's tough to see in that picture is those glass chambers inside them, they have uh, little cylinders. Those cil cylinders would hold animals. Those animals would have little mini face masks put on them and be forced to breathe uh, aerosolized biological weapons uh, to determine whether the weapons were effective. So aerosol chambers are things we can try to control to prevent countries from having a capability to, to deliver a biological weapon by aerosol. So I'll be much more brief in this picture, but this is just showing that the process is the same for chemicals. So with chemical, you're not getting your pathogens from the environment or the laboratory, you're getting your precursor chemicals from industry. And those precursor chemicals are, are used in uh, industry all the time for legitimate purposes. Um, then we also have the concern of, of bulk chemical weapons that are also out there uh, as part of programs that we're still dismantling, programs that are acting in secret, um, some that are buried and discovered, um, et cetera. Once, but so let's focus on the precursor chemicals. Once you had the precursor chemicals, now you're going into production. The production process actually looks very similar to a biological production process, except instead of growing something, you're mixing stuff. So you're still using pieces of equipment that you can monitor and control but instead of those equipments being fermenters and giant incubators, now they are special mixing vessels that have certain qualities that keep them from being corroded by the chemicals that are being mixed. And that's how we try to monitor them. If you then move on to delivery, uh, the top picture depicts uh, sort of a famous assassination of um, Kim Jong-un's Jong half-brother in a Malaysian airport using um, VX nerve agent. Um, but also you, you all have probably heard of the Navalny incident uh, where uh, he was uh, intentionally targeted by a Novichok chemical. Um, and then there was also a, an incident in Salisbury, UK called the Skripal incident where another uh, former Soviet uh, person was targeted by uh, a similar uh, chemical agent. So uh, the first way to use a chemical agent is to just go at one person. Uh, and and uh, that's harder to control from a technical standpoint. But the second and third ways are to use what you see in the middle, which is actually a, a cool video if we could play it, but we won't, where people are using some a similar aerial dispersal technology like we talked about with bio. So something we can control. And then the bottom is actually loading them into munitions that have uh, special dispersal uh, bursters. So. Uh, non-explosive detonation so that the agent in, isn't destroyed and boom, they burst and, and that's an, your third way of, of delivering. So those are the processes. What does it all boil down to? Um, so what it boils down to is there are three things that you try to control. Um, you try to control either the pathogens or the precursors and that, that, are that initial acquisition step. And then you try to control the infrastructure and expertise that you need to take the pathogens and precursors through that pathway of production and delivery. And there are two sides to, to how you address that. First is the, the supply side. My opinion, that's where we can actually make a difference, right? Because we can go in and we can try to actually control these assets and keep them from getting into the hands of potential bad actors. The second, but where there is far greater threat reduction, reduction potential, if we can manage it, is the demand side. How do we keep international parties, states, substates, terrorists, individual actors from wanting these weapons and seeking them? Uh, what we need to understand is that we probably can't control everything, but what we can do is slow down the process. And if we slow down either the supply or demand of any one of these things, we're actually having an impact. So just like um, uh, Ms. Rockwood was describing sort of a patchwork quilt, quilt that's where we are in, in largely the biospace, but also, also the chem space, where we're just trying to figure out layers of barriers to keep these things from getting in other people's hands. Okay, so what, are we, what do we actually do? Um, so from a, a supply side, and this is the bulk of my career, so this is what I, I typically think of when I think of of, um, of uh, disarmament, frankly, um, is the first thing you wanna do is get, so the philosophy is get rid of what you can and secure what you can, okay? So if you're talking about 
pathogens in a laboratory somewhere. Um, the first thing you want to do is try to get that laboratory to get rid of them. But laboratories have these pathogens for a reason. They're assets to them. They use them for research. They use them. And, and it's, you'll hear uh, in my line of work, laboratories trying to do a quote unquote strain grab. They're trying to get different pathogens in their labs so they can study them. So a lot of labs won't give up uh, their biological agents. And if you, won't, if you can't convince them to give them up, then your next best thing is to, to consolidate them in a single space and protect them. Uh, there is a, a, a woman, Nana, who asked a question in the last session about, um, you know, insider, it, to me it was about insider threats in nuclear facilities. And so um, in, the, in the biospace, if I think a lot of you have a nuclear background. So if you think about a nuclear facility and how you're trying to protect against insider uh, theft or, or diversion, you typically focus on the places where you don't have, you, you have the nuclear material in bulk, right? You don't have it in uh, countable fuel rods, for example, because that's the easiest place to steal it. Well, in the biological sphere, everything is in bulk because it just takes a little tiny bit that I can dip a pen in something and walk into another room and grow it and have plenty. So it's really hard to actually have a material accountability for pathogens. So when we try to protect um, pathogens that we can't eliminate, we protect from the inside out, meaning starting at the source of the pathogen, but not necessarily with material accountability, with personnel accountability. And we build very robust personnel reliability programs uh, that require the people who have hands-on access to these pathogens uh, to go through all sorts of security screening, security training, and follow specific protocols, including what's called two-man rule, where a single person like me can't go have my hands on something like anthrax without another person being in the room, et cetera. Uh, why, again, is that important? Because historically, and especially from a terrorist perspective, the majority of, of capabilities start with an insider, an insider who has hands-on access to pathogens and will take them and use them, take them and sell them, uh, take them and, and divert them in some other way. So that's what we do. Uh, and that's, that's really our biggest bang for our buck on the pathogen side. There is another step of controls where we uh, try to limit pathogens being uh, uh, transferred from, from laboratory to laboratory, especially internationally. Um, and there are different uh, mechanisms to control that, but we have more challenges with that than working with the laboratories themselves and establishing controls. So let's just quickly go through infrastructure and expertise. So infrastructure and expertise are again, dual use, right? So you know the term in chem and bio, that means that they're used in industry all the time. Uh, the pieces of equipment you can use to make a biological weapon for the most part are, are things that I can find in any academic laboratory. And the expertise, aside from discrete weapons expertise, which is very important because of the trial and error process that's involved in developing a weapon, we have PhD scientists now and frankly, high school students that can do a lot of these steps. Uh, so it's just very hard to control. So how do we do that? Um, well, the first thing we do is if there's a weapons program, we disarm it. So if you look at the pictures on the right hand side of the screen, the top picture is what's called a pathogen. These are real pictures, by the way. So the top picture is a pathogen repository. And in the back corner, if you see that sort of um, container looking thing, that's, that's a liquid nitrogen doer, and that's holding um, weapons from a, the former Soviet program. Uh, and so again, our goal would have been to eliminate that, and if not, make it safe and secure. In this case, we, we made it safe and secure, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The middle picture is these massive fermenters at a different former Soviet facility, and, you know, it doesn't really have a dual use purpose. We could have tried to divert them to a yogurt production plant, to uh, a vaccine production plant, but in this case, we ripped them out and destroyed them. Uh, and that was the best thing we could do. So we try to disarm weapons programs where we can. Um, but then because dual use equipment is everywhere, the best thing we can do is, is try to implement export controls uh, to keep really the larger, more dangerous equipment from being spread everywhere on the bio side and on the chem side, the, uh, the non-corrosive equipment from being spread everywhere uh, where we, we really admittedly let the smaller items and the other still usable items slip right through our fingers. Uh, expertise, 
again, we can divide that into two categories. So first is a weapon scientist. The most important thing to do if you're trying to control proliferation is control weapon scientist. I equate it to baking a cake, right? So your pathogens and your precursors, those are your ingredients. They're obviously important. You can't bake a cake without them. Your infrastructure, that's your uh, laboratory. And, and in, in this uh, analogy, this would be your kitchen and your cookware, also needed. But what do you also need? You need a chef and just not any chef. You need a chef with the right recipe, right? So you can get a chef out of a PhD program and he might be able to figure it out the same way we all try, or at least I try, and then my family tries to eat my food and it's terrible. Um, or you can get a chef who actually has the recipe. And those are the ones from former, former weapons programs and they've been doing that. So the first thing we try to do is control weapon scientists. But then again, for non-weapon scientists, we do very robust personnel reliability programs to try to keep the people with hands-on ac access to pathogens and infrastructure uh, from diverting them. Uh, and then we also engage them. So if there are scientists in Russia that are working in a facility that used to be a part of a weapons program, one of my jobs used to be to do research with them. Uh, and through that international collaboration, our goal was to, uh, to bring them into the international scientific environment so they would be less likely to, uh, to divert their skills toward illicit ends. And then the last bullet there, control intangible transfers. Uh, what that is getting at is, again, the recipe. So maybe a weapon scientist is, now has access to email. He's 70 years old in, in Russia. Um, he's retired but he wants more money or needs more money. And you know, someone sends him an email, hey, can you tell me what your, your growth formula was for anthrax? You know, that's an email. So, and it's really hard to, to monitor. And those are the types of things that we really need to try to control. That's all the supply side. That's what I think works because that's what I've done. The demand side, and I don't mean to be negative, but if you go back to, uh, to Ms. Rockwood's presentation, right? Well, was the question? Well, what's the punishment when someone breaks the rules, right? And she says, well, you know, factually, she says, well, it goes to the UN Security Council and sometimes there's a punishment and sometimes there's not. So um, what we try to do with demand is we try to set these international standards on the chemical and biological side the same way the MPT does. Um, and we also try to uh, use those standards to allow international disincentives and sanctions when people break the rules. But on the bio side, we've had a minimum of two countries break the rules. And on the chem side, we've had a minimum of two countries break the rules. And those are you know, conservative numbers, obviously, right? So just like Ms. Rockwood was going through her timeline and saying, okay, we had this thing, but then here's Libya and here's this other country and here's all the, you know, how good are we doing, right? Um, on the, so that's the international level. In general, international level is an obligation for individual countries to introduce their own national legislation. So a lot of the teeth of these international um, bodies comes in national legislation. National legislation only goes far as the national purview is, right? So US may have very strict national legislation about using a chemical agent, but if it's used in Russia, it doesn't apply, right? Uh, and so we'll sort of talk briefly about what options that gives us. And then the last way we can, um, we can deal with the demand of, of biological and chemical weapons is just to make them obsolete by pr protecting ourselves better. Uh, and a lot of our money, especially on the bio side is being dumped into that right now, trying to especially capitalize on the momentum of COVID-19 and saying, you know, if we invest wisely, we can probably put ourselves in a situation where we can't be effectively attacked by a bio biological agent internationally. Um, and there are a lot of uh, thoughts on that, but I, I actually am a proponent of that. Okay, so I, I'm already short on time and I, I just wanna gloss through this slide. But the point of this slide is simply to remind um, you that uh, especially on the bio side, the international uh, agreements are obligations by the state's parties, uh, but they're aspirational. And those obligations include the requirement to introduce national legislation. And the national legislation is where, um, where the rubber meets the road and there's actually an impact of the rules of the treaty. Then there's international harmonization bodies sort of in the middle that try to keep everything standardized. The main one of which is the Australia group, which lists the things that should be controlled, 
the cutoffs of size and material for the different infrastructure that's flying around all the other places. It has no authority whatsoever, um, but it is a nice harmonization body to keep the rules standardized. On the chemical side, same thing. We've got the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, we've got UN Security Re Resolution 1540, which is really focused on substate actors um, coming in the early 2000s, but not after 9-11 so much as after the discovery of uh, illicit um, nuclear networks out of Pakistan. Uh, and then those filter up into uh, export controls and legislation on a national level. Uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention in particular is considered so the Biological Weapons Convention is frowned upon because there's quote unquote, no verification regime and it's failed. Uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention has some very good strong points. The first of which is, um, you know, it's non-discriminatory. It's not like the NPT where it says there are nuclear weapon states and, and non-nuclear weapon states, even though there are chemical weapon states and non-chemical weapon states, it doesn't make the distinction. It says chemical weapons are bad. If you have them, you have to get rid of them 100%. You know, you're not keeping your nuclear weapons, you know, I mean, you're, you're not in this case chemical, you're getting rid of them. Uh, and if you don't have them, you can't get them. And it has this verification body uh, that says, and we have the right to go in and check to see if you're actually uh, um, developing the weapons or if you committed to destroying them, if you actually did destroy them. So that all sounds great. And it sounds like a big upgrade from the Biological Weapons Convention where there aren't those things. But then what do we see? I mean, we, we see, uh, the use of chemical agents in three assassinations, high profile and no activity, right? And there are a lot of reasons for that, but it's similar to the NPT where ultimately uh, the implementation body of the Chemical Weapons Convention, which is called the OPCW, has no authority. It has to go back to the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council has to act. Uh, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council have the right to veto any action. One of those members is Russia, another is China, right? So it becomes a politicized process. That's, I apologize for being negative, but that's just my position. Okay, so let's uh, quickly go through one case study. John, I'm checking my time just to make sure I'm not talking too late. I'll do two seconds on this. So let's just talk about a real program. Um, I mentioned that uh, the former Soviet Union had an offensive biological weapons program. It was one of the ones that was happening in contravention to the Biological Weapons Convention. Uh, and after the, the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, you know, First, people got worried about all the nuclear material that was everywhere, but eventually they came around to bio and said, well, hey, these same pathogens, infrastructure, and expertise are at risk. And I was with Jean at the, at the Middlebury Institute at the time I had just finished my postdoc there. Um, and we were brought in by uh, a contractor through the Department of Defense in, in the US to work collaboratively with Russia to get rid of these, to address these issues. Uh, what do we do about the pathogens? What do we do about the infrastructure? And what do we do about the expertise? So here's an example of a pathogen repository. This is uh, similar to a picture I showed you before. Uh, so before I showed you, I guess, a, a, a nitrogen, liquid nitrogen doer. In this case, these are plant pathogens that were devised under their weapons program to destroy all of America's uh, food supply, uh, agricultural food supply. And so the idea was uh, a, an attack of scarcity, right? Uh, in the upper room in the upper right is their actual pathogen collection. Every one of those little vials is a weapon. Uh, it's a small amount of a weapon called a seed stock that then you grow up uh, into a large amount of weapon because it's biological. It is secured, if you look in the lower right picture, with a piece of clay and string. Uh, and the door to the room is secured by another uh, piece of clay and string. So what we get, and then the picture up top is that this facility made vodka and we drank it and they always got to laugh with the Americans when we dance with their, that's their kitchen staff and their outfits and their accordion. Uh, but the point is here that uh, we wanted to eliminate these, these uh, pathogens because they could be used as weapons, uh, but they were the assets of the facility. So we couldn't get their permission to do that. So we had to secure them. And the way we did that was we moved them to another ring, wing of the facility and we built our inside out security program around them, starting with a personnel reliability program. And it just so happens that this facility, and you'll see a picture in a later slide, one of the scientists was one that we knew had gone to Iran to share information. And it was a very big deal as I'll try to show you in a slide from now. Okay, so infrastructure, conversion or elimination. Well, we've already talked about uh, these pictures, right? So bacterial production in the lower 
left and viral production through incubators in the lower right. These are in the same facility, a facility called Pokrov outside of Moscow. Um, the picture in the upper right are, is a massive pass-through um, autoclave. So if you're in a, a laboratory working with biological agents, whether it's for weapons or, or, uh, or not, you have what's called clean and dirty sides. Dirty is when you're in a place where the pathogen is and clean is when you're okay. You can walk around in your shirt and tie and you're fine. Uh, well, people go in and out of those generally through a corridor process with showers, uh, but how do you get materials in and out? Um, one of the ways is through a uh, pass-through autoclave where there's a wall and a dirty side and a clean side. And in the middle is a chamber. Uh, you open a door on one side, you put in whatever you wanna pass through, you close it, and then you autoclave it. And what autoclaving is, is generally just cooking under pressure. And then once you've autoclaved it for a set amount of time to kill whatever pathogens, in, pathogen it is you're worried about, for example, anthrax, then you open the other side and can take it out. Uh, but in typical laboratories, this is a very small thing, maybe like a, if you think about like an ATM window type of thing. Um, these are massive and they had much bigger ones the size of elevator doors where they could actually walk entire animals into and just autoclave them down because they were doing um, experiments on animals using these biological agents to see how effective they were. So these are things that we had to actually rip out and destroy uh, because there really was no peaceful purpose for them. And then let's go to scientists. So um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll just focus on the one picture. But again, the idea is the scientists from this program knew how to make weapons. Um, and the picture I'll focus on is the picture with, uh, you, you probably recognize our, our former president, uh, Barack Obama. At the time he was, um, he was a senator and the man to his uh, left, uh, so on my right of the picture is, is a man named Dick Luger. He was the, sort of the, one of the fathers of the program. Uh, and uh, Dick Luger was getting ready to pass off the program to, uh, to at the time, Senator Obama. We didn't know at the time Senator Obama was gonna become President Obama in, in a short time. Uh, so they came over to tour the facilities in Russia, which is you know, where I lived and worked. Um, and so there I am standing in the background looking like, like a goofball, but the point is why are they here at this facility? And the reason is because of that man standing on the other side of, of Barack Obama. His name is, is um, Dr. Makarov, and he was one of the people that had gone to Iran to share information, right? So what we needed to do was engage this person and make sure that he didn't keep sharing his secrets. And it is a, an emphasis on how important the chef and the, uh, the recipe are in our overall scheme of things to, to just illustrate that the future president of the United States is at this little facility outside of Moscow with a goofball like me and another senator just because of this one guy. That's how important it is. Um, so that, that, that'll bring me to our conclusion. And again, I just wanna reiterate that we like to think of things in terms of building blocks, the pathogens, the precursors, uh, and then the infrastructure and the expertise. If we can slow down any of them, we can. It'd be great if we could slow down the demand of them. And the best way to do that is uh, international measures um, like uh, the conventions that then we establish national legislation to, to implement, um, but those have proven very ineffective, unfortunately, on the chemical and biological side. So we typically will focus on supply and trying to, uh, to eliminate what we can eliminate and uh, secure what we can and then control transfers as much as possible. Uh, so thanks very much and probably want to talk about COVID-19 now, but I'm open to all questions and just uh, in advance, Jean will provide my email address and you, if we don't have time to talk about your question today, we can certainly uh, uh, do it by email, okay? Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Rich. Um, that was a very, very inter interesting lecture. I've heard you sp speak many times and uh, um, I, I always learn more. Uh, we have three questions. Um, you correct that there was uh, quite a bit of chat yesterday about COVID. Um, with the, some sort of questions about whether this was uh, human made uh, in terms of, and so the first question is, uh, how's the coronavirus produced? Or which one of the delivery methods used for release of the virus is ravaging the world? Uh, this kind of question is, comes from um, Rose Onaja. Uh, Bati Mwango asks, um, why do Russia and the United States have smallpox store in their labs? And why there, is there no international pressure to destroy them? Is the pressure only inflicted on Middle Eastern countries and countries from the global south? And then th third question, um, 
Have there been nations that acknowledged and took responsibility for releasing chemical and biological weapons by accident? Thanks. So those are all good questions. So let's focus on the first question. Frankly, this might take up the rest of our time, but um, the, the question presupposes uh, that coronavirus was produced and delivered as a weapon. Um, and the I understand that there are some theories out there that that may have been what happened, but my uh, analysis, and I would say the position of most uh, uh, analysts in this field is that this was not a weapon at all. Um, that doesn't mean that it wasn't necessarily um, derived from a laboratory. So let, let me just try to explain a little bit about how viruses work. So um, we've been worried about pandemics for a long time. Uh, and uh, what the concern is, is that um, pathogens exist in the wild, in nature, in animal reservoirs. They exist inside animals, right? Uh, and for the most part, we don't interact with those animals, right? Uh, but then to translate this to an Ebola example, then there's a hunter that will go out and potentially, instead of killing an animal, collect an animal carcass that is on the ground that died of something. And that connection between the human and animal, what we call the, the, the human wildlife interface, is what then gets that Ebola virus from the animal reservoir to humans when he brings that carcass back and it is uh, sold as bushmeat uh, and through the distribution process causes infections, right? So, um, what ha what's happening on a global level now is that our population is going whoosh, right and in particular in india and china uh you know in the next few years over half of the world's population will be in india and china because of that population growth we have industrial expansion and we have rainforests being knocked down and agricultural farming extending into places it's never been and so we are increasingly being exposed as humans to these animal reservoirs that typically um, we would never have come into contact with. And there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of viruses that we've never seen and don't know what they are out there. And any one of them could be what sparks the next pandemic, okay? So what did scientists start doing? Uh, Scientists, including the US and China and many, many, many other countries uh, started going out to these, these animal reservoirs as yet reached by human populations to collect samples and try to see what viruses are out there. And so as we started doing that, mainly about 20 years ago, um, we started seeing, okay, there really are just thousands and thousands of these viruses. Okay, now editorial aside, Rich Pilch is okay with this part up to now, okay? But the Rich Pilch is not okay with what I'm about to describe. So what we did then was we said, okay, well, how is our knowledge that all these viruses out there are out there going to help us prepare for the next pandemic? Well, what we need to do is develop vaccines, right? And diagnostics, right? Uh, well, how do we do that? Which ones do we develop them for? So we started a line of research called gain of function research, where we started manipulating the genetic material of these viruses to see if they could evolve naturally, though we were simulating it in a, in a laboratory to be able to spread very easy from person to person. Okay, the experiments that I'm describing are called gain of function experiments. And they've been going on for a long time and I hate them. They're incredibly high risk, and in my opinion, very low reward. And if anyone argues with that in the scientific community, my response is, well, how much did they help us prepare for this pandemic? Not at all, okay? And we had been collecting, in particular, influenza viruses and coronaviruses for, for over a decade and been doing these experiments to see which ones could be adapted in the laboratory, simulating natural processes um, to spread from human to human. So forget about weapons, but now we've talked about, there's 
two places where these pathogens are, right? Just like we talked about before in our lecture. They're out there in the environment, but we brought some into the laboratory. And not only that, we've been messing with them. We've been manipulating their genetic structure. And not only that, but we've been manipulating them uh, to see if we can make them more dangerous, right? More spreadable among humans generally is, is what we try to adapt. So now flash forward to December of 2019 and cases of SARS-CoV-2 start to appear in Wuhan. Now, the question is, is it coincidence that the first cases we identified uh, both by the Chinese authorities, but then on an international level, happened to be identified in one of the, in the city that housed one of the laboratories that was doing exactly the type of research on exactly the type of pathogens that I just described. They were collecting coronaviruses from places where they don't come into contact human, with humans, bringing them to the laboratory, and then seeing if they can make them more dangerous. And in addition, that particular laboratory where they were doing the, the work has sort of a poor safety record. Is that the potential source? Is it more likely the potential source at this point uh, than just that this occurred naturally, uh, in fact, went from an animal to a human, say, in uh, a, a live meat market or what we call a wet market, and then adapted in humans to spread very well. And I think right now, the WHO has an investigation team in Africa to try to sort that question out. If you asked me a year ago what I thought the most likely answer was, I would say I 99.999999% of the time it's natural. It's most likely natural. We just missed it somehow. Uh, the virus somehow went from an animal reservoir to humans and was spreading and adapting, learning how to spread uh, between humans better and better and better. Then when it adapted the right way so that it spreads very efficiently among humans, boom, it was off. That happened to be in December, 2019 in Wuhan. And that was the origin of the pandemic. Now, a year later, after having researched it for a year, I would not be surprised if it turns out it came from the laboratory as an accident. Uh, so the delivery, uh, the you know, the your question about produce and production and delivery is there was no production and no delivery. But what we're seeing is something that is once it is, infects a person, it spreads very well from person to person. So you don't need, uh, you know, there's no external delivery. It's being delivered by us, and you don't need to produce it either. Uh, you know, it grows inside of you. So now if you translate that question to a terrorist perspective and you say, well, what if a terrorist wanted to use COVID-19 as a weapon? Then you go back to my first slide and say, well, here, what are the steps? Uh, acquisition, production, delivery. Well, someone's already infected. So that's acquisition. It's producing inside of them. So that's production. And they deliver it by spreading it by their mouth, you know, breathing on each other. So that's delivery. And so we definitely worry about now that it's out there, people who are infected deliberately walking into a synagogue or a mosque or a church or a hospital where they want to affect people and actually using it as a weapon. Um, but it didn't originate that way. So that's the, the first question. Uh, the, the second question about uh, the smallpox virus. So yes, three billion blocks, great. Um, why do the US and Russia have smallpox virus stores? So uh, the, the comment is accurate. So smallpox, um, was a historical scourge. It's killed billions of people, um, but it only uh, survives in humans. So it was actually something like polio that we were able to try to eradicate, and we uh, effectively did eradicate it in 1977. There was one case since then, which was a laboratory accident, and then in 1980 we declared it um, we declared it destroyed. Uh, as a global body, uh, we asked the question under the WHO. The World Health Organization. Well, what do we do now? Do we destroy all the stockpiles or do we save them? Now back then genetic engineering and the ability of someone like myself to sit in a laboratory and rebuild these viruses from scratch didn't exist. Okay so or it was in its infancy. infancy. So the question was well okay I agree it makes sense let's just get rid of it wipe it off the face of the earth then we, no one can use that as a weapon. But then what happens if Somehow we need to study it, things we can't predict, right? So the decision was made to preserve it in two WHO operated laboratories, one in the US and the CDC in Atlanta, and the other initially uh, in Moscow, but then moved to Novosibirsk um, at the Vector Laboratory. And that's where officially um, the smallpox virus remains. It's really not a proliferation question of whether we keep the viruses now. It's, it's, 
it's a global health security question. Do we still need the virus now, now that we've shown that we can rebuild the virus from scratch using laboratory techniques? Um, and my inclination is I worry about, I hate stuff we do in laboratories to build stuff and screw with stuff because it's unpredictable. And that means there's risk. And to me, the risk never amounts to the reward. So my inclination would be let's keep the stockpiles, but stop messing around with stuff in the laboratory. Um, but there certainly is a position like, uh, like is mentioned in the, uh, the question that some people you know, believe and I think you know, have, have strong arguments for actually going ahead and destroying them. And there's an entire book on this um, called Scourge by uh, my for, one of my former bosses, Jonathan Tucker, which goes in depth into the decision not to destroy it. A uh, second book called Demon in the Freezer by the same uh, person, Richard Preston, who wrote The Hot Zone. Um, uh, Rich, the, the, Rich, I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt. I really apologize, but we, we have to uh, conclude, if you don't mind. Uh, we have several more questions. Um, and uh, if you are so inclined, um, I would uh, perhaps ask if you could perhaps address some of these questions. We'll send them to you uh, very briefly. Um, sure. But we have a, you know, another panel coming up, um, which we will have to delay shortly. I apologize for uh, rushing you through this. Um, Not at all. It's my pleasure. Especially that, you know, given the COVID issue, it's, it's very uh, topical. So I'd like to thank on behalf of everyone. Thank you very much for your very thought-provoking and interesting presentation.